our second lunch and learn. Um, we have uh, Ray Johnson, the executive director for the Wine Business Institute at Sonoma University, correct? That's right. Ray, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, I'll share my screen and um, bring up the presentation and we'll talk along the way. Let me make sure, can you see that okay? Okay, super. So it's, it's been a, certainly a challenging 12 months, but everyone is so optimistic about where we might go. Um, each year, uh, we conduct a survey with industry executives, um, interviewing people from the C-suite, you know, ownership, but also commanding different um, uh, business units, uh, thought leaders in the industry. And uh, we start out with our board members. Uh, we have quarterly meetings, so I always pose the questions to them, right? What's, what's the big opportunity for you today and what are the biggest challenges that you're facing? And so we get input from people like Mike Osborne uh, at wine.com, uh, Gary Heck, large uh, bubbly producer, um, but small or very small family wineries too, like Ron Rubin. Uh, and then people in, out in sales and distribution to get a sense of what the marketplace is like too. And then we uh, combine that with a general survey of people in the industry of about 150 people every year. Now it is mostly a West Coast uh, focus. I, I will tell you, Adam and I talked about that ahead of time, but I'd like to talk about some of the parallels that exist wherever one might be uh, across the country. So as, as we asked people what was really negatively impacting revenue, uh, you see the two biggest on the left there. Um, those who had a strong position in the on-premise channel. Uh, and as you, did you have restaurants shut down or did you not? You did, okay. So, so that was just a killer because it, not only is it a sales channel, it's a place where consumers can try the wine if they haven't been out to the winery, right? Uh, so that was really dire. And then, of course, the limitations on wine country visitation. We were locked down pretty, pretty hard. Uh, and, of course, we gradually um, moved into outdoor tasting. And now today we're actually able to have people indoors in a limited capacity. Um, so it, that you know. And I, I, it's, it's been a challenge for people everywhere in the nation. And then you look at what has made a difference, like what, what has driven revenue? Because as we were talking before we started the session, this hasn't been bad for everybody. It's been disruptive, but as far as revenue goes, some are doing just fine, if not better. And we saw people shifting more product to online sales, whether it was through online retailers or their own online. And then the other is to put more emphasis on the, the wine club and developing relationships with people who would be steady customers uh, buying through a wine club since they couldn't visit the winery to actually make those purchases in person. Um, of course, you know, three tier was a disaster uh, unless you were a giant winery and you already had presence because what we've heard from so many experts is that in a time of um, upheaval, people turn to trusted brands and reassurance. They aren't going to try new brands that they don't already feel comfortable with. So that benefited people who had a strong presence in retail. And it also benefited people who had strong DTC sales with their base. Um, cash flow surprisingly wasn't keeping the majority of people up at night as much as you might think, because people were pivoting and making conscious decisions to stay ahead uh, during this now 13 months of, of turmoil. Uh, and then this is an interesting um, uh, set of statistics that captures, I think, where the opportunity was and could continue to be. And that was sales growth continuing upward in direct to consumer. And uh, for small wineries, of course, this is the lifeline. It's the best channel because you get to maintain you know, your profitability in a way that you never would out in distribution uh, when you have to give up so much margin. So uh, we know that in general, the wine industry has a challenge it, with its demographic base. Uh, it's most loyal customers who can spend the most uh, who have the, the wherewithal to do so are an aging group. And 
it's really incumbent upon us as an industry nationwide to, to figure out and crack the nut, how do we engage more younger consumers? And what, we've, what we know, I guess, uh, again, is that uh, this is borne out in the numbers. Most of our consumers are um, of an older demographic, uh, but it is moving up. And some wineries have been able to position themselves and describe them in such a way that they are viewed uh, favorably by younger consumers who, who want to um, try them out. And so um, we asked people if they were pursuing initiatives specifically to target un, uh, younger groups. So not underage, right? We're not talking about that, uh, but people of legal drinking age, 21 and above, but under 40. And organizations that have a big marketing department, as you can see, it's easier for them to do. But some small wineries are doing it as well. And I wanted to get a sense from you today uh, and open this up for discussion. Um, what are you doing to attract uh, younger consumers into your wine clubs and into your visitation? Uh, so I'd like to hear from everyone who has a winery uh, already existing on this. So let me change my view just so I can see everyone. Oh. Oops. Uh, Rhonda, could I start with you? Oh, absolutely. I was trying to find the right button. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I'm in good shape. Um, so I would say that we probably are more in the yes category on the, on the smaller uh, producer size, size, of course. Um, and mainly just because of our, we're starting to do a little bit, everything's social media, of course. So that's kind of a generational thing, but um, the, the type of social media. So we're uh, starting to branch out a little bit into TikTok, which is crazy, insane, but talk about the ultimate rabbit hole. Um, but it seems to work. Um, People are loving our videos and we've just done a few um, and maybe leaning more towards TikTok and Instagram. And we're still on Facebook, of course, but Facebook um, maybe is a, is a little bit of the older population is what I'm finding. Mm -hmm. But um, really other than, um, than our, our um, like painting parties and things like that. And we're trying to do some like uh, wine, um, the tasting parties that we've got some individuals that aren't even our wine club people um, that are not developed by us but local groups that have put together their own wine club and they meet here and it's the younger group and it's really just like a book club it's really just a drinking club it really had and they happen to do it at a winery but um, I don't know so, so a few things like that nothing major Okay, Rhonda, but they're drinking. But they're drinking your wine, which is great. Yeah, they are. They are. Rhonda, I got a question. When when you because Rhonda operates a brewery as well. Um, when you opened up your brewery, did that sort of pulling in the younger audience as well? Uh, yeah, of course it did. Uh, but mm. not not really. I mean, obviously to the brewery, and yes, it did increase some at the winery. Um, but. Uh, our hours are different, so we get just like one hour of overlap, except on Saturdays. But yeah, it, it has helped, of course. Hmm. And uh, Carrie, how about you? Yeah, so I'd say one of the biggest things that uh, is promoting younger folks is weddings and, uh, you know, birthday parties and sort of events, fundraisers especially with younger groups, but uh, having events where uh, weddings is probably the biggest one because you've got a large group of people. They're all, uh, and if they're going to have it there, they're going to spend some money on the wedding itself. They're going to have a little bit of wherewithal. So that just getting the, the name out there and people coming and being present at the vineyard, <clears throat> that's really the trick for us for our specific winery vineyard is getting them there. And maybe it's the same with everybody, but Boy, if I can if I can get somebody on site, the rest is easy, uh, just because of the nature of the place. 
Right. They have a chance to experience it, touch it, and then fall in love with it. And actually along, along the lines of wedding and the reason we're, and we we're promoting it with our seal, we've got two, there are two uh, large high schools in the area that uh, we've got banners or signage, well, it's electronic too, in the gymnasiums. Uh, and that's promoting the wedding, but also wedding venue. But again, it's just, it's, it's a younger crowd. They're not going to come and drink, but they're going to th- just that over a long term, that presence of mind about the facility is there. That's right. And their parents will see it as well. That's true. Yeah. Great. Uh, th- thank you both. Um, and then I wanted to go on to, uh, oh, but one I wanted to mention too, that um, one of the wineries I spoke to out here is using, and that is they're using a, an app called Podium. And uh, it's a way for people to uh, book an appointment, uh, book a visit at a winery. And there's more use of these types of platforms um, and applications and software to help people make a decision when they're in the region uh, about where they might visit. And, and so it's another avenue to explore to see how it might help drive some additional consumer traffic. You said podium, is that? Yeah, podium, just like a, a podium that we would stand up uh, to when we're talking. Yeah. Is that similar to like seller pass and for reservations or? I, I, I don't know. Uh, and uh, it was the first I had heard of it, but the, the winery using it was very successful in its application. So uh, yeah, check it out and see if it's similar to Seller Pass. Yeah. Um, and we, we, we all know that digital is important, right? And we knew this before the pandemic, it became even more clear uh, during the pandemic. The, the pivot to digital is gonna be vital for the industry uh, to communicate with consumers. And we asked all of the participants uh, how they're allocating money uh, to cover digital uh, and very few are actually spending more dedicated dollars to it. It's a lot of uh, shifting of expense to take money from one pot because we didn't have to market to go, uh, for example, uh, share samples with people in the restaurant business in, in the local region. So we could allocate some of that money over to digital. Uh, but we know that digital is really our lifeblood. And we've seen people do incredibly well um, we were just discussing this last night in our wine entrepreneurship class, uh, the importance of doing virtual tastings and, and how to do them really well and how it could really be a lifeblood and um, a, an additional source of revenue above and beyond what visit, visitation revenue could bring. Um, so I want to get a sense of um, what you might be doing in terms of digital? Are the things you're doing differently now because of the pandemic that you're going to continue to do? Uh, and if so, what have you done and what, what's worked for you? And Carrie, could I tar- start with you? Um, we are, well, for one, one thing that we are doing is we went, started online sales April 1 of last year. <laughs> uh, we, we were ramping up to kick it off. And so once this happened, we started online sales. So, I mean, we're a relatively young facility, so, which is why we didn't have it before. But then um, this year, probably within the next 30 days, we are going to have our uh, wine club in place. Uh, And both of those things we're promoting heavily with social media and uh, also with Google advertisements um, where we have a budget for Google ads. Uh, Most of it is for the the winery and for Muscadine wine. And also we've allocated some for the wedding venue as well. So that's in terms of communications and spending, that's been a, over the last year, Mm -hmm. uh, we've been ramping up spending for our allocation. Really Google is the big one. Right. And how about you, Rhonda? Yeah, we've put some some money towards Facebook ads, and we um, we've done we did actually finally start our wine club, and did our first release in March. So we did some uh, some Facebook ads, some social media ads, getting promotion bef- 
you know, leading up to that. And that's been very successful, money well spent. Mm. And have any of you or, or your colleagues been doing um, uh, virtual tastings uh, with consumers at their homes or, or their offices? JB has, Adam, you may be able to, you may know a little bit more than. <clears throat> yeah, there's actually a few um, wineries in the state that have been doing virtual tastings. I was hoping Don was going to be on the call to talk about it a little bit. Um, but um, they've had good success with it. Um, and I think some of the wineries, uh, while some of them had took it, taken it as a serious approach, you know, serious sit down, kind of, you know, buy the wine before and we'll, we'll walk you through it. Um, some of them also kind of took a more uh, uh, off the cuff, uh, wacky approach to it, which um, became a sense of humor that I think their consumers enjoyed, um, which was kind of nice as well. Um, so they kind of, poked fun at themselves and some of the, uh, uh, I guess, the misconceptions or connotations of, of the fruit wines and sweet wines that we produce here. But it, it kind of made for a, a fun uh, uh, show. So there's been some good success in it, though. Adam, you, you bring up a good point. Um, from the best practices that we've heard people share, uh, it's important not to be one talking head uh, lecturing to a group of people who are tasting the wine in their living room. Uh, the, the advice is really to have it, A, be interactive, have them involved in some way. Uh, B, have more than one person behind the screen. So um, if, you've ever, if you ever get a chance, sign up for one of the wine.com um, virtual tastings, live stream tastings, they call them. Uh, to get a sense of now, I mean, they, I, I get that, you know, wine.com is it's a big company and they have a big budget, but there are practices that you can extract from what they're doing that are um, amazing uh, and they're effective and they sell wine. And um, it's not just with the big guns. Uh, one of our alumni who uh, has a PR firm, she's helped some, some wineries uh, lead virtual tastings and, and really, uh, incredibly successful in bringing in revenue. Uh, but there are a lot of things that you have to get right. I mean, they need to get the wine ahead of time. Uh, so that has to be in place. It, it can't be at the last minute. Um, the other thing to not overlook is um, the opportunity to do it with corporate groups who would normally do offsites. I and mean, we've talked about weddings, for example, for fa family groups. But we've also seen wineries do well with corporate groups who come in uh, they have an offsite, they get familiar with the wine and uh, they fall in love with the wine while they're getting business done, or it's just to blow off steam and it's a social for the organization. And what one of our board members started doing were um, virtual tastings like that for some of their client companies in San Francisco. So, you know, an hour and 15 minutes away, uh, the, the clients couldn't come to the winery during the lockdown. But what they're finding is after the lockdown, they think it's going to continue because it, it was easy. It was, a, it was an easy way for people in the office to take a break together, have fun, you know, visit virtually uh, and do it together. So it, it's something to consider putting in your repertoire um, uh, of virtual experiences. And then the last one, one I'd leave you with, uh, another one that came up last night in entrepreneurship class, and that was um, bringing something in to the tasting, to the experience beyond wine. So uh, you, can say, you can say, for example, this wine would go great with XYZ dish, but if you could have somebody there to make it with you, it, it, it really taps into the success of what you see in the various food programs and cooking programs that are all the rage on, on, uh, on television and online. And uh, it just makes it, it brings it more to life cooking and drinking and, and they really get how to use your wine. Yeah. And I, I think to, to, yeah, to that point, um, cause uh, the Collier group, I, I know they're doing Fridays. They typically do a noon, just talk about wine with JB on the, the patio. Uh, but their most well-received videos have been uh, Katie's kitchen which she's actually in her kitchen cooking and talking about the wine as she's pairing it with whichever she's cooking. And that's been the most well-received at all of them. Yeah, it's neat. Hey, I, I was going to add 
to the conversation. Um, so in my role, <clears throat> excuse me, I work with other craft alcohol industries in Tennessee and the Tennessee Craft Brewers Guild had a virtual ale trail is how they presented it. And it's a little different because they were dealing with individual cans versus entire bottles of wine, but they had like 19 breweries across the state participate. Um, people signed up and they had designated pickup locations. So the people came, picked up their beer, took it home. And then they had a Facebook live event uh, where they had the, some of the different brewers were there speaking and some different stuff. But So all that to say, it was a, it was a different industry but it's something that is, is on the virtual side and they had tremendous success for it. They sold out of every box they had available. So that virtual idea is something that even as the pandemic is, is lifting slightly and, and, and things are opening more, people are very used to it now. That's right. They're comfortable with it. It doesn't feel like a bad substitute anymore. It can feel like an opportunity. Um, you know, my wife and I have talked about that. We love to travel and we haven't been traveling, but there've been some really great, virtual travel experiences uh, available online as, as a way just to you know, experience it and feel it as best as you can. Yeah. And we talked with folks about potential growth opportunities in the future and sparkling uh, over the last several years continues to come up on top as one of the best areas for, for growth uh, as well as alternative packaging. And maybe we're going to stop using the phrase alternative packaging uh, uh, to talk about everything other than the 750 milliliter bottle, because we are seeing broader acceptance, certainly cans, box wine is through the roof. And um, th those opportunities are gonna exist because some of the behavior of consumers has changed. Uh, people need to be able to take their wine to go from a restaurant. Uh, and that's been loosened up in many places around the nation. And we'll see how that fight goes now to be able to maintain that opportunity in places where it's been legalized. But cans have certainly facilitated that. Uh, and I'm wondering, oh, get, go ahead, Kerry. Yeah, I was gonna say that we've, uh, in addition to our basic wine categories, we've got a, uh, a 500 milliliter um, dessert wine, which is a fortified wine, 18% alcohol. And boy, when people taste that, it's, it's different enough and unique enough that that's really been a big boost. And also we've just uh, started a 375 milliliter bottle wine that, especially for gifts and for, I mean, that's, that's really selling as well. I, um, I think consumers just like options too. just want something different, you know? I think you're right. And uh, the idea of the gifts, it even extends into ways to stay connected with, um, with your clients. Um, one of the winery owners I spoke with said that during the pandemic, they couldn't go visit their restaurants out in the market. They couldn't go live, right? They would start bottling three, seven, five uh, milliliter bottles for them as a less expensive way to be able to get those wines in front of the sommeliers and other people who are the gatekeepers so that they stay connected with those gatekeepers, but didn't have to have the expense of sending full bottles of wine. Um, it makes sense. And as we look at the trend towards um, more healthful consumption, uh, people are consuming less. Uh, you know, per person uh, in, in situations where they may have had more in the past. Um, and we're seeing that with younger people too. And so half bottles seem to make a nice fit for people who may not want to open a whole bottle. Um, yeah. And then have that feeling of obligation to try to finish it. Right. Do you, and I, you don't have it on here, but do you know how cider is trending right now? No, oh, I don't. I don't. Um, look at... Um, uh, look at Gomberg Fredrickson for the latest data on that. John Moore Marco at BW166. Uh, he should have the latest on that. And, and the other thing we're seeing too is, is people um, diverging into other products that are wine-based. Um, so not only do we have... Um, you know, like flavoring put into wine, but there, there was a really cool product called Gaze. It's G-A-Z-E, 
that was developed at vintage wine estates. And uh, again, it, it breaks the boundaries of what is normally felt uh, wine is. And it could be a little iconoclastic as a, as a consequence, but yet it, it, it could be an answer to bring in some consumers who might be still a little reticent thinking that wine is a bit stuffy and it helps, you know, bust that image. We have two wineries here doing a, a sweet tea wine. Neat. And how, do you know like approximately how alcoholic it is? is <laughs> um, they're, they're both running, uh, I want to say one is running at about 9%. The other one I think is just above seven. Um, yeah. It is blending sweet tea in with a fruit wine base. Uh, the other one is actually fermenting the tea. Um, Interesting. Yeah. It makes sense, right? And with the lower alcohol profile, people can have that with their lunch. I just wanted to speak on something that kind of has covered everything that we've talked about so far that um, I've noticed just within my first few months here is that with in Tennessee in particular, there's a big stigma around wine. So anything that we can do to kind of help remove that stigma, and it can be anything from like corks being a little like some people have literally I've asked I just ask random people all the time um you know kind of what their thoughts are and if they drink wine if they like wine what kind of wines they like that kind of thing and I mean some people literally like are afraid to buy corked wine because they don't know how to uncork it and it, it there's just where we are as a state um there's still a lot of stigma that you we don't see in California so much. Um, and so yeah. anything that we can do from the canned wines to the sweet tea wine to one thing that I've noticed has been really, really successful on social media has been talking about the grapes, like the agricultural aspect, um, telling people about each grape and like what, when it was created and that kind of stuff has been by far our best, like every single time I post about a grape that it just goes wild. And it's crazy because like when I look under the hashtags that I use for it, there aren't really any other associations doing that. So I don't know if it's because we're in a much more farm, mm -hmm. uh, you know, farm state of mind, Tennessee, um, or if it's that there's just that stigma and needing to get more comfortable with the idea of wine, but um, kind of touches on all three of the pages we've seen so far. Yeah, uh, we know that younger consumers really like authenticity and they want to know about the provenance of a, of a product, right? And where it comes right. from. Yeah. So we don't, and, and in the old school thinking, we used to bore them too much with too much information, right? And then they felt like they needed a degree to, to even drink wine and then that put them off. But today, I think we're getting that right balance, right? Where they want to know where it comes from because it's agriculture. Yeah. And so I also had that thought originally when I started kind of trying to plan out how I was going to do social media and everything um, from the association standpoint, because I used to work for a um, management company. So I had a bunch of I had a bunch of properties just the same as I have a bunch of wineries now. But the difference is like the association versus not. So how do I make sure that I'm like um, just overall lifting wine in Tennessee. And so I started doing wine words. So words that like varietal and things that may be a little bit different to somebody who's not a big drinker, um, as well as the grape facts. And then I've done uh, features, winery features, but grape facts just shoots the wine words out of the water every time. The grape facts just, it's what people want to know about which I really thought that the wine words would do better. And they do, I mean, they do attract people. I've had a few people, if I share them like on my story, some of my friends will be like, oh, I've been wanting to learn more about what that means. And I'll be like, click on the link, <laughs> go to it. So I do think it's there, but I was uh, really intrigued. Like it's been something that's been very, um, I've been very interested in it and it has been how well the grapes themselves do. Yeah. So. And, and Rhonda, how, how about you? What are you pursuing? Any new uh, product categories or deviations from the norm? Well, um, we've done a little, a little bit of the solder. Um, it's kind of pan, kind of leveled out here. Um, maybe because of the brewery, um, because we do have more options now. It's not just wine or cider. We do, we do have a brewery that, but we, we do a lot of cider down there. Um, they, um, the non-beer drinkers actually appreciate having the cider down there. 
Um, but sparkling wine is something we're probably going to venture into here in the next, hopefully, year if everything works right. Uh, we did release a new sweet wine, which sweet wine sells in Tennessee. So we released a new sweet wine uh, the beginning of this month and um, limited edition. It's gone, it's gone crazy. We we blew through um, about half of our production in the first week. So, <laughs> but nothing wild and crazy, just another skew and, and solder. Yes. And, and could I ask you, um, those of you who have wineries, um, is there something you've changed uh, or learned during the pandemic that you're definitely going to continue to apply uh, going forward in the next year? Wine slushies. <laughs> Literally, is it a, a, like <laughs> buy it to 7-Eleven? It is stupid. It is stupid, insane, crazy that people will come in and buy five or six. I, I've seen people come in, one person come in and we have to get a box for their wine slushies. <laughs> okay. Good luck with your insulin pump, but okay. <laughs> right, right. I think every winery in our state does it, not just in, in our state, but almost in the South. Um, Missouri, they actually have a wine slush trailer that goes around from festival to festival selling nothing but wine slushes. Yeah, and you can buy it at the grocery. I've seen it at the grocery store now, so it's definitely the newest thing. Wow. Robert? Uh, well, we're not producing wine yet. We've still got a couple of years to go, but I'm really enjoying the conversation. I, I did want to make a comment about Tennesseans familiarity with corks. Uh, Tennesseans are familiar with corks, but they're just in uh, brown jugs <laughs> as opposed to bottles. <laughs> That's good. I can't, stop, I can't stop that. The one thing that we're doing, we've actually, uh, our sales since basically September of are significantly higher than our sales were the year before the pandemic. Um, and, but we're, we have still haven't really opened up our retail space <laughs> and we're not doing tastings. Now we're going to start doing tastings, but we're going to, so we're just offer people the bottle glasses, crackers. We don't have a restaurant crackers, cheese, prosciutto at picnic side, table side, cafe tables outside. And now we're, what we're going to do is just limit, instead of tasting all our wines, now we've got a, maybe a, a dozen wines now, that, and we were tasting eight before. So now we're going to just pick four for the week and say, these are the wines we're tasting. And then do it outside and at the cafe tables or at a picnic table. And uh, pr we probably, I mean, we, we'll still use the tasting room some, but for you know, busy times, we're just going to reduce the amount of tastings we do. So leave people with something more to, to try and let them buy it. So that's, that's, and that's all because of the pandemic. We would not have done that. I would have never thought that would work. But uh, anyway. Uh, bravo. I, I applaud the idea. Um, it gives them a reason to come back, right? J just as you said, um, it, there's a, there's a point of diminishing return we found, uh, mm -hmm in giving people too many tastes of wine. Um, and what people have found here that you may venture into, uh, and I, it, this can feel incredibly risky when I talk to winery owners that have done it here, the decision whether to go to a system of by appointment only or not. Um, it, I, I'll give you one example, Linmar Estate. Um, Talking with the owner, uh, it was a it was a heavy decision whether to do it or not. Uh, and this was before the pandemic, and um, they decided to make the jump. And what happened, they found, was of course the foot traffic was decreased, um, but the sales per person went up because they were able to control the flow in such a way that everybody had a lot of attention. They felt really taken care of, and so those consumers spent more money. 
and wine club signups went up and it just created a more devoted customer uh, who's more loyal after they, they get home. But it, again, it's, it's, uh, it's scary if, if you go first in a region. I don't know, do, do people uh, require that in, in your wine trail where, where people visit wineries? Does anybody require appointments? We no we one to, to make a reservation, but we don't require it. Okay. Yeah, there's there's no one in the state that I'm aware of that requires it. Some will allow it, but no one requires it. Okay. But it's something to consider in in your calculus as you go forward, especially Carrie. You had mentioned, you know, when when it gets busy again, right, and how, how you manage that. And and like uh, Adam, you referenced that. It's not that you wouldn't take somebody if you had room, you would, right? They could walk in and you'd make space, but you'd have a way to be able to say, you know what, I wish you would have called. Uh, we, we, we really are at max right now and uh, we'd, we'd love to have another time. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, a, it's a dicey thing to introduce to consumers who haven't been trained to expect that. Mm -hmm. so, but, yeah. yeah, we so we have a group on sales, you know, where people designate a specific time for a you know 30 minutes and a tour and a this and a that and they of course the other thing about that though is they are expecting to be you know if you've got if something else is going on you have to tell the other people these people have priority because they've ha have a reservation you know so yeah it, you're right it's a that's a and then staffing is the other issue there too right yeah, you can manage staffing and personnel better or, or more easily if you know what the volume of customers is going to be. Yeah. Wow. Um, I just I wanted to leave you with a, a, a brief look at what we do at Sonoma State. Uh, we're about an hour north of San Francisco. And our, our flagship program is an executive wine MBA. So it's a full on MBA, but it focuses on the business of wine. Uh, so you may have a friend or a colleague, uh, maybe uh, a son or a daughter, uh, next generation, uh, who would want to come and join us. Our, our next, uh, well, most of our classes when we're in person are in the Wine Spectator Learning Center. Uh, but we have a program that's mostly virtual, uh, and that's our global program, which begins in the fall. And it's an opportunity for people to participate in a wine executive MBA, but be able to do most of it from where they live and work uh, with some residential sessions. And Ray, I'm going to pass that on. Uh, JB, actually, him and I talked about this for him um, not too long ago, but we're going to, I'm going to pass it on to him so he can look into it. Oh, super. And I wanted to share with you um, the story of two people on this slide. These were the, this was our well, we had 24 people in our first, first cohort back in 2012. And this was a snapshot of a couple of different people who've gone through uh, in that first group. And uh, that the first one on the bottom row uh, is, is Chris, uh, Christine, Christine Musto. And her family has a grape and wine business up in Connecticut. And so I, I wanted to underscore how all the people in the program are not necessarily from California. And uh, for her, it was a really good opportunity because they're selling grapes, selling wine, brokering around the country, uh, and especially up in the Northeast where the climate is a little harder uh, so they can bring you know, different grapes from other parts of the country to their winery clients. And then the man in the bottom right, um, uh, Christian Allman, oops, uh, he is the next generation at Six Sigma Ranch and Winery up in Lake County. And his parents started the brand uh, and Christian had an idea that he worked into his capstone project during the program. And that idea was, what if we were to set up a resort where uh, people would come and stay on the property or stay on other properties connected to Six Sigma? And, and he worked this through, he did the financials, uh, had a dream. And that was back in 2013, he worked on that project. And next spring, they are opening up a resort on their ranch. It's gonna be gourmet uh, and uh, glamorous camping. Uh, so there's a glamping operation, another company that's invested in this. And he really feels that the MBA program uh, and the capstone project he was able to do uh, 
gave him the opportunity and the breathing space to, to work on that, uh, that idea and really craft it into a project that, that is now becoming a reality. And what's cool is it's another revenue stream that allows them to leverage the property, right? And they've done it in other ways too. Um, they raise pigs, they have a meat club. Uh, so not only the wine club, but you, know, you, could, you could enroll in getting gourmet uh, meat shipped to your home. Uh, and they have a waiting list for their meat club. I, I think it's just such a cool success story. And I think it's an example of how you can look at other ways to leverage your agricultural enterprise, your property that's sitting there uh, and put it to a, a really good high use. And I hope to see you someday in person. We could have a glass of wine together on the terrace of the Wine Spectator Learning Center uh, out in Northern California. Here we go. And I'll stop sharing. And Don, I think Don just joined. Um, we're at the end of the meeting, but I do have all this recorded and we'll share with you later on. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Go ahead, Rhonda. I was just wanted to say thanks. It was a great presentation and, and um, interesting to see um, the bigger picture other than the Upper Cumberland region of Tennessee. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for inviting me today. Uh, it, it was really great talking with you and, and learning about how you're, how you're working through. This is a challenging time, right, for everyone. And, uh, but you're seizing opportunities and you're creating opportunities. It sounds great. Hey, everybody, thank you very much. Oh, uh, you're most welcome.